Do in the Morning tagged me to make a video with at least one mathematical or philosophical paradox. Sorry for being a bit late to the party, but things have been too noisy around here for me to record my audio. But I've got two paradoxes, both of a more or less philosophical nature. This first paradox is really just a fun little riddle with paradoxical features. I will pose the riddle, but not solve it for you. I'll leave that to you, my viewers, to discuss in the comments section. The second, more serious paradox is that question I titled this video with, Is Consciousness a Self-Referential Paradox? I'll deal with that question last, but I won't answer it either. Here is the riddle. The hobbits, Frodo and Sam, are heading home to the Shire after having disposed of a certain ring, when suddenly a chartreuse dragon pops up from behind a large boulder and grabs Sam. Frodo begs the dragon to give Sam back. So the chartreuse dragon says, If you can predict correctly what I will do with your friend, I will return him to you alive and unharmed. However, if you do not predict his fate correctly, I will eat him. Frodo knows this about chartreuse dragons. They are great sophists and scrupulously honest and honorable when it comes to keeping their word. Here is the puzzle to think about. What prediction should Frodo make to save Sam? That's the riddle I challenge you to solve. The logical mechanics of that riddle are not original with me. I just changed the characters and setting so you could not easily find the answer on Google. It's a very old riddle. One of the paradoxical elements of the riddle is what happens if Frodo predicts you will eat him. Then, just like with Russell's paradox in set theory, it flips back and forth with each evaluation. If the dragon eats Sam, Frodo is right and the dragon must give Sam back unharmed. But he cannot do that. He can't even nibble off one of Sam's toes and call that eating because that would be harm. But if he gives Sam back to Frodo, then he cannot eat him. Well, at least not right away. Likewise, when thinking about the set of all sets that are not members of themselves, the set can only be a member of itself if, and only if, it is not a member of itself. If the set is a member of itself, then by definition, it must not be a member of itself. And if it is not a member of itself, then by definition, it must be a member of itself. And the evaluation keeps flip-flopping back and forth so fast you could use it as a computer clock. You have reached the point of no discern. Sometimes it's an incorrect assumption that makes a statement into a seeming paradox or contradiction. For example, Right now, it is both daytime and nighttime. That could seem like a paradox or a contradiction to someone who puts night and day into the same kind of binary either-or category people tend to put true or false into. Same with right or wrong, atheist or theist, left or right, stupid or smart, hot or cold, member or not member of a set, etc. How can it be both day and night? We know it can be both because we have a physical model we can reference to understand the phenomena rather than relying on simplistic binary linguistic abstractions or flat earth models. A glance at a physical model and we can see that if it is daytime in some part of Australia, it must be nighttime in some part of North America. Now, if we think of a physical model for set theory, Let's say sets are like boxes. We can put little boxes in bigger boxes, but what we cannot do is put a box inside itself. What would that even look like? A Mobius box? A Klein bottle of a box? The TARDIS inside the TARDIS? If you don't like boxes, consider the typical method of illustrating set theory, Venn diagrams. Consider how would we distinguish a set that is a member of itself from one that is not? 
Here is a set that is a member of itself. And here is a set that is not a member of itself. What kind of difference is there between them besides the labels? In order to represent a set as being a member of itself, we would have to put a representation of that set into itself like this. And that implies that the representation within the set will also have its own representation of itself. And that representation must have another representation, and that representation yet another, and so on into infinite regress. So, before we even get to the paradox of the set of all sets that are not members of themselves, we've got a problem with the simple concept of whether any set can be said to be a member of itself when it implies this infinite regression. Going back to the idea of finding physical models for our concepts, the concept of infinite regression is a bit bogus. It's not really infinite. It's just a process with an obvious feedback loop. Each iteration of the process takes time and it cannot go on forever because the process that creates the feedback loop has physical limits. And that includes the human brain when it contemplates set theory. You've probably both heard and seen feedback. When a microphone creates that awful high-pitched screeching sound at a concert, it is because the sound from the speakers makes it back to the microphone and is re-amplified. Then it is sent through the speakers again. This loop happens so quickly it creates its own frequency, which we hear as that howling screech. To make video feedback, take your webcam and aim it at the monitor where you see the webcam's output. The image on the screen is picked up by the webcam and sent back to the monitor. Then, that image is captured again and fed back to the monitor in a continuous loop, creating a kind of tunnel image. You can also wiggle the tunnel about by moving the webcam slightly. One reason this is not a true infinity is because the image from the webcam is delayed a fraction of a second as it travels through the wires and circuitry of the camera and computer before it is output to the screen. Thus, it would take an infinite amount of time to get an infinite number of copies, even if it looks like it happens instantaneously. Another reason is that each copy of the image is degraded, it's shrunken, and after less than a hundred copies, the last captured image is likely to be a single pixel in size. It will have no detail. This kind of feedback gives us a new model to use when thinking of the paradoxes of self-reference. Consider two famous examples where self-reference occurs. Kurt Gödel's incompleteness theorems and Alan Turing's halting problem. Both of them used this kind of feedback loop, or what to be serious called recursion. Paradox. It is the idea of recursiveness itself that is paradoxical. The concept of recursiveness is in itself paradoxical. It's the idea that within a process, the process is repeated. Some people use Gödel's theorem as a way to claim a kind of bogus scientific authority. I'll link an example in the underbar where someone claims it can prove God. But when you start pointing out problems and asking how, you get, sorry, it's too complex to explain. And it is, because it's hard to judge the merits of such arguments when Godol's paper is filled with weird symbols, theorems, definitions, and it's ridiculous to expect an average person to both read and understand it, much less know how it relates to broader issues outside of its limited mathematical scope. The important thing to keep in mind is that all that Gödel proved is that when using formal mathematical systems, you can create legitimate mathematical expressions that are true, but still can't be proved within the system. 
you can still prove things by going outside the system or outside the box. It doesn't necessarily mean there are truths that can't be proven. I do believe there are truths that can't be proven, but it's not something that, that has to do with Godel. The way to understand how Godel's theorems might apply to areas outside math is to look at how other people have applied similar self-recursive techniques, like Alan Turing, who proved it a similar theorem in computer science called the halting problem. The advantage is that you are much more likely to understand Turing's paper than Godel's. And Turing's proof relied on pretty much the same kind of self-reference technique used by Godel and Russell. The halting problem is about whether it is possible to avoid, in all cases, programs that won't stop calculating. Like when trying to calculate pi to the final digit or getting stuck in an infinite loop. These are programs that never finish. So, imagine having a program that could detect all these cases before they ran. Turing imagined a program that could check any other program and its input to tell if it halts. And then he asked, what would happen if you gave that program itself to check? You get stuck in an infinite loop of self-reference. The problem with proofs like Turing's, Gödel's, and Russell's is that they are indirect proofs. An indirect proof, like reductio absurdum, is done by assuming the opposite of what you want to prove. Then you show that a conclusion that comes from that assumption is nonsense, paradoxical, or contradictory. Any proof of that kind should leave nagging doubts in your mind because it is a weak proof. Remember what I said earlier, depending on your model of the world, the evidence that it is day and night at the same time could seem paradoxical or contradictory. Another way to imagine this is to imagine an alien species that can see only in high contrast black and white and it wants to prove that an object it cannot see is white, so it proves that it isn't black. Thus, by double negation, the object is proved to be white in its mind. It depends on the existence of a dichotomy, true or false, black or white, good or evil, a dichotomy that might not exist. Proving that something is not black does not prove it is white. It could be blue, or green, or red, or dark gray, or anything. How does this apply to paradox? Consider the simplest paradox there is. The sentence that states, This sentence is false. If you think truth or falsity is actually a property, and the only two possible properties of statements like that then that statement is a troubling paradox. But if you can see that truth or falsity is not a property of the statement, but merely a judgment of the mind that evaluates the statement, and that that evaluation process is not just black and white, but loaded with color, then the resolution of the paradox is trivial. And this principle follows on to Russell's, Gödel's, in Turing's paradoxes also. The mathematical language of Russell and Gödel, like sentences in English or sentences in any other language, do not have the property of being true or false without the evaluation process of a trained brain to decide it. Nor do computer programs that are not running on computers ever get stuck in infinite loops. So, the paradox of self-reference, when analyzed, brings us to a deeper self-reference. It refers to ourselves, the mental processes within ourselves that evaluate the statements and equations, and that we try to model with computer processes. So now, I'll leave you with the final question and see what kind of discussion happens. Is consciousness a self-referential paradox.